show your support. Follow me on Twitter. Hello, I am that British guy and welcome back to the Raw After. Now in this series I, instead of looking at a historic WWE pay-per-view, I take a look at what happened on the episode of Raw the night after that pay-per-view. Now the episode we are looking at this time is the episode of Raw after the 1996 King of the Ring. The King of the Ring where Shawn Michaels defended the title against the British Bulldog where Ahmed Johnson beat Goldust for the Intercontinental title, and much more famously, the birth of Austin 316, thanks to that very, very famous promo, after his win in the King of the Ring final against Jake the Snake Roberts. Austin was reportedly uh, busted open in his match against Mark Merrow and uh, cut all of his lip open. He was rushed to hospital and received stitches and then was rushed back to the arena in time to compete in the final and win. So obviously with all that momentum from the King of the Ring victory, with Ahmed Johnson's momentum from winning the uh, Intercontinental title, let's see what happened on the Raw after. And we do indeed start off with the new Intercontinental Champion, Ahmed Johnson. It is explained pretty much instantly that he is the first African American winner of any kind of gold, singles gold, in the WWF. They mention this a couple more times. Uh, it seems even back then they were quite big on pushing the uh, historic thing. And he is facing off in a non-title match against Hunter Hearst Helmsley. A very different, a much smaller and younger looking Triple H. And the start of this match is very much played on the strength of Ahmed Johnson. Uh, sort of throwing, uh, I nearly called him Triple H then. Throwing Helmsley around the ring quite a lot. Um, and it takes kind of... Uh, Helmsley low bridging Ahmed Johnson as he charges towards him um, for Helmsley to then get the upper hand. Now, <clears throat> you could tell even way back then that the better worker of the two was clearly Helmsley. He is bumping exceptionally well um, at this first stage of the match, just showing off Ahmed Johnson's strength and power and dominance. Um, as I said, he is much smaller himself, so probably if you saw him another sort of five, six, seven years after this, they probably would have been a lot closer in terms of size and stature. But it was almost, although he doesn't obviously look like a cruiserweight, it was kind of played almost like a big guy, little guy type of match, purely because of the difference in size of the two guys. Now, once Ahmed Johnson um, spills to the outside, Helmsley uses the uh, environment to kind of gain the upper hand, the rail, the ring post, the steps, and he kind of sits on top of Ahmed Johnson for the middle section of the match. Um, and this is, I think, mainly because during this time we get a, a kind of a video uh, interview between Vince McMahon and Gold Dust. Gold Dust, obviously, as I mentioned, just lost the IC belt the night before at King of the Ring, and he is banned from ringside, so that explains why he's not come down immediately to um, attack Ahmed Johnson at any point. Um, and he basically says, look, um, last night I kind of let um, my, my good nature... Uh, kind of cost me. I decided to try and save Ahmed Johnson's life. Um, that infamous kind of mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation moment that uh, if we are to be uh, believing that Ahmed Johnson was very much against and Goldust did it anyway and then Ahmed Johnson kind of went a bit mad for the end of the match. He said, look, I, I, uh, I kind of gave in to my humanity, if you like, and uh, saved him in the match, and that cost me. So the next time we will face each other, um, I will end it. The interview then 
kind of changes tact towards Goldust and The Undertaker, and recently Goldust had managed to secure Undertaker in a casket and uh, get a victory over him. And the next pay-per-view international incident, which will be a few weeks from now um, up in Canada, there will be a return match between Undertaker and Goldust, and Goldust just basically is saying, look... Um, I'm, I'm not fussed about The Undertaker either. He lost last night because he faced Mankind. Um, and I've already beaten him once before, so I'm sure I can do it again. And there will be kind of a, a reprise of this little rivalry a bit later. Anyway, by the time we get to the end of this interview, it's pretty much Ahmed Johnson all over. Uh, Helmsley again. He goes for the Pearl River Plunge, but Helmsley manages to kind of counter out of that and get a brief minute or two back on top. And then another Pearl River Plunge, kind of from nowhere really, um, seals Helmsley's fate. And Ahmed Johnson is victorious in his first match as the Intercontinental Champion. And he decides, as he did on the way down to the ring, to uh, hold the belt upside down. He decides to hold the belt upside down again to celebrate with it after the match. And there is a short post-match promo um, with Doc Hendricks where, again, they bring up the whole first African-American um, singles champion. And Ahmed Johnson says, yes, that might be true, but I am still defending this title for everyone. I'm not defending it for um, the black fans. I'm defending it for the white fans, the green fans, the red fans. Um, to which King brilliantly says, yeah, look at all the green people, Ahmed. <laughs> um, which was uh, quite a nice little touch. Um, brilliant heel work all night, to be honest, with, um, with Jerry the King Lawler who himself faced uh, the Ultimate Warrior just the night before. And after this match, we do get a bit of a promo for the encore of King of the Ring, which we'll be showing later that week. Goes through the matches, Undertaker vs. Mankind, uh, Ultimate Warrior vs. Jerry the King Lawler, Ahmed Johnson beating um, Goldust, and HBK defending his WWF title against the British Bulldog. Strangely, they don't mention the um, any of the matches for the actual King of the Ring, even though we already know that Austin is the winner of the King of the Ring because they have already announced that at the beginning of the night because he will be in the main event against The Undertaker. But there we go. Next up, we have a tag team match between the Brooklyn Brawler and Jerry Fox, who don't get an entrance. And they will be facing off against the Body Donners and their new manager, Cloudy. They do get an entrance, but first we get the entrance of Sunny making her way down to ringside to join Vince and the King on commentary. And once she has kind of settled herself, the Body Donners and Cloudy make their way down and... Uh, especially after seeing the Lashley Sisters segment very recently. What is it with Vince McMahon and men in drag? It's It was old and tired then. Obviously it's old and tired over 20 years later, yes. But oh, it was such a transparent way to just shame uh, the Body Donners for having um, a, a hideous and ugly manager but without having to kind of poke fun at a, um, I'm trying to think of how to word this delicately, a seemingly less than attractive female uh, manager, they just decide to dress up a bloke basically and act like it's a woman because obviously. The match itself was pretty inconsequential to be honest, the Body Donners were pretty much dominant for most of it, working as a very kind of cohesive tag team. But this was all about the story of Sonny ditching them once they lost their tag belts and um, kind of joining the smoking guns so that they could win the belts themselves. Um, she teases that she is planning on bringing in a single star as well 
to challenge either Ahmed Johnson or Shawn Michaels, or perhaps even both of them, for uh, singles gold, but she does not reveal who this actually is. Anyway, as I said, yeah, it's all pretty much on, on her. All she's doing, rather than actually adding anything to the match, is talking down Cloudy and telling her to go away and leave her alone. And after the Body Donners win, Cloudy chases Sunny around the ring a couple of times, and Sunny runs away. Oh, God, she's so annoying. Her voice is horrific, and it's clear that they only kept her around because they liked the look of her, and the crowd cheered when she kind of came out and strutted around, basically. She adds nothing at all to the product or any match that uh, she's kind of involved with. Next up we get a video package um, kind of highlighting the breakdown of the Rockers, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty, um, how uh, obviously Shawn Michaels career has kind of gone to new heights and Marty Jannetty's hasn't because obviously he's become the Marty Jannetty of the Rockers. Um, and they fought each other for the Intercontinental title and had one win apiece. And this is kind of being seen as the end of this kind of longer term rivalry, although they haven't really done much together or against each other in a while. They will be facing each other the following week on Raw. Um, and I can guess which way that match is going to go. Next up, we have a six-man tag match. Already in the ring, we have Savio Vega, Barry Horowitz, and Montoya as well. And they are facing off against Camp Cornets, Vader, Owen Hart, and the British Bulldog. And this match is... Again, there's a bit more competition in this match than there was the previous tag match. But Camp Cornet working very, very well um, together as a team. Cornet is on the commentary desk again. Um, and this match is A, basically to give Bulldog a win back after losing against Shawn Michaels the previous night. He gives Vader a win back after losing to Jake the Snake Roberts the previous night at the King of the in the King of the Ring semi-final. And it is basically being used to advertise the six-man tag team match between these three guys against Armin Johnson, The Ultimate Warrior, and Shawn Michaels at International Incident. Which seems really weird. You've got your Intercontinental and um, World Champion in a six-man tag match. Just kind of shows how thin they were for challenges for the main belt mainly I suppose and um, they could have quite easily gone back to gold dust um, going back for the intercontinental championship I'm sure there were other people in the pipeline as well the likes of obviously Owen Hart and uh, Steve Austin becoming the intercontinental champion in 1997 so they must be on the uh, the cusp here um, probably not uh, Helmsley at the moment because don't forget the um, the curtain call was only a few months prior and he's still kind of in the doghouse makes me think that's probably why he was uh, bumping so well for Ahmed Johnson and making him look good um, just to kind of try and put himself back in the good graces of Vince and the bookers and obviously the writers so yes, uh, the international incident um, pay-per-view they, they're kind of just bigging that up um, and obviously mainly mentioning that six-man tag, not really paying any attention to this match either, um, which kind of draws you out as a viewer. It's just sort of happening. Um, Owen Hart does manage to get the win with the sharpshooter, um, the sharpshooter that was stolen by Bret Hart, as uh, Cornette mentions. And... Uh, Yes, as I say, gives the win back to Vader and the Bulldog after their losses the previous night. Now, just before the main event, Steve Austin, who is already in the ring without any kind of an entrance, uh, before we see The Undertaker come to the ring, we have Brian Pillman coming to the ring on crutches. And he is getting up in Vince's face, demanding his paycheck. He's been there a week and he hasn't got any money yet. 
Um, clearly, he's not in any fit state to wrestle, and Vince points this out to him, and he just kind of leaves it and walks away. What? They, they play up the fact that something big and controversial was said the previous night. They don't really mention what it was. Um, presumably as a way of getting you to kind of look uh, into the encore uh, um, taping of King of the Ring to kind of build up that intrigue, maybe, because they've already told you the results of all the other matches. Um, but it was a bit weird the fact that they made this big deal as to the fact that Brian Pillman was planning on coming down and who knows what he's going to say because he's so unhinged and he could say anything and look what happened last night. But then they don't actually kind of play on that anymore. They don't really bring it up or relate to it directly. So it kind of just left me feeling quite confused if... I was obviously watching at the time and I wasn't able to buy the pay-per-view. I've got no idea what they're talking about. So, yeah, bit weird. Anyway, The Undertaker comes to the ring, obviously accompanied by Paul Bearer. And Jerry the King Lawler basically makes it his mission throughout this match to point fingers at Paul Bearer, saying that he intentionally struck The Undertaker at King of the Ring with the urn giving mankind the victory. It wasn't an accident, it wasn't a miscommunication, he did it on purpose. He, at the early stages of the match, tries to kind of get this out of Paul Bearer at ringside, who he just keeps turning his back on Jerry, um, and on the camera as well, until the King kind of gets bored and goes back to join Vince McMahon on commentary. Now, the structure of this match is very curious. Obviously, Taker lost the previous night, and they actually make mention of the fact that he has never lost two consecutive matches. Now, he lost the previous night because of the uh, the urn, being struck with the urn, cost him that match, so obviously he didn't lose clean, and so presumably they want to give him the win back here. But... You've got Austin, who's just won the King of the Ring and kind of needs to carry that momentum forward. Otherwise, it's what's really the point of that victory the previous night, especially as um, I'm sure you're well aware of at the time, Jake the Snake Roberts was going through quite a few personal issues, um, which led to um, him kind of drinking way, way too much. Um, I'm not entirely sure if drugs were involved as well, um, possibly, uh, but I don't know for sure. Um, and he was also injured, um, his ribs were injured in his match with Vader. So although um, Austin legitimately split his lip open and came back, he was facing an older competitor, because they make mention of Roberts' his age of 41 as well, they play on the fact that his ribs were injured and the King plays on the fact that he likes one too many drinks um, and Vince kind of half-heartedly tells him to uh, kind of stop it. So it's not really the strongest victory for Austin, although he does become King of the Ring. It's not like he fought off um, someone like Owen Hart in his prime, say a former King of the Ring winner, or... Yeah, sort of a, a, a new up-and-comer or former champion like Goldust or even Helmsley, who obviously was supposed to win the uh, the King of the Ring. Um, so, yeah, he, he kind of needed to keep this momentum going. And Taker dominates kind of the early stages of the match. Austin tries to kind of start a fist fight with The Undertaker, which even then was never a good idea, and Taker kind of dominates the beginning bit until a chop block to the knee, and Austin then targets that knee throughout the rest of the match, and wrestles in a way very akin to a Ric Flair or a Triple H, to be honest. There is multiple um, kind of ankle and knee locks um, on the mat and kind of from standing and seated positioning. He smashes the knee against the apron, he, against the ring post as well. He's just constantly targeting the knee. He's um, kind of elbow dropping the knee and stomping on the knee. 
um, just so that whenever the Undertaker is up on his feet, he's obviously having to sell the knee and isn't really able to kind of properly get back into the match because as soon as he builds up any kind of offence, Austin just targets the knee and Taker goes down like a sack of spuds. So, obviously that makes very good sense. It shows good ring smarts. It kind of plays back to his ringmaster um, gimmick where he was kind of... Um, a kind of technician kind of character where he knew all the holds as Ted DiBiase always used to say um, so that made sense and it's at this point that Goldust makes his way down to the ring and sits at commentary again that's the third person if you're keeping count fourth if you kind of count um, Pillman but not really because he didn't stay there for very long and Goldust doesn't really say much he kind of mentions about uh, the fact that he's already beaten The Undertaker and he's not fearful of him. And just as it looks like The Undertaker is kind of getting back into the match, he no-sells an attack by Austin, gives him a choke slam and gets him in position for the Tombstone pile driver. Gold Dust gets up onto the apron and throws some gold dust into the eyes of The Undertaker. Um, right in front of the referee, obviously that is the disqualification. Undertaker wins via DQ because he was the one that was attacked. Goldust then just disappears. So that was a bit weird. He didn't even kind of make the Undertaker vulnerable in order to attack him ahead of his match. He lets Austin try and do that, but Undertaker kind of fills his way round. He, he, He's backed into the corner, basically, and he manages to kind of dodge an attack and um, pound on um, Austin until Austin bails. So Austin doesn't really get the better of Taker uh, in the post-match either, even though Taker is seemingly blinded. So Austin's lost the match via disqualification. He doesn't seem too annoyed at Gold Dust for costing him the match either, even though he was kind of um, having the upper hand, apart from obviously about to be possibly tombstoned after being choke slammed. And yeah, Gold Dust attacks Undertaker, giving him a win, which is weird. But then if he'd have attacked him with the dust to then try and physically attack him after the match to beat him down, that would have made sense because it makes him vulnerable, but he didn't do that either. So it was really, really weird booking, and presumably done just to give Undertaker a win after his loss um, at King of the Ring, and also to kind of give, make it so that uh, Austin wasn't pinned and didn't submit, so it's kind of the weakest possible victory for The Undertaker to get against him, I presume. Um, it just seemed a bit weird, and I would have liked it if he'd have at least kind of chased after The Undertaker, maybe. Uh, sorry, chased after Goldust, maybe, to kind of try and get some retribution against him for costing him the match. It was really, really weird. Anyway, uh, the King makes his way up to the apron again, and he's sort of blaming Paul Bearer again. Where were you? Why didn't you get Goldust down off the apron? Um, and kind of tries to play up what he was saying earlier to The Undertaker of the fact that Paul Bearer is costing you at the, at the moment. He, um, he meant to hit you with the urn last night. He didn't bother trying to help you last night. And Paul Bearer is kind of backing him away and, and kind of controlling him still with the urn. And Lawler manages to kind of run away. And at the end we see The Undertaker on his knees kind of taunting up towards Paul Bearer and the urn. They are still clearly united. Um, and what was interesting is in about a year's time, obviously Paul Bearer does turn on uh, The Undertaker to bring in Kane, insinuating that The Undertaker murdered his entire family in a blaze years ago, except that his half-brother Kane managed to survive that and he's on his way back. And obviously he made his entrance at the Bad Blood pay-per-view and cost The Undertaker the first ever Hell in a Cell match against HBK. So kind of very, very early seed sown for that. Um, and essentially Lawler was right. Also during this match we are reminded that HBK and Marty Jannetty will be facing each other the following week and Mankind will be going up against Mark Mero. 
and this is kind of um, reiterated right at the close of the episode and then they just sign off with The Undertaker and Paul Bearer in the ring. So it was a very odd kind of ending. So there we go, that was the Raw after the King of the Ring 96. Um, it starts off very, very strongly. Um, obviously, Ahmed Johnson, after his title match, uh, managing to win his first match since becoming champion. Um, being in the ring with Helmsley was, uh, I think, a good shout in terms of that because he was able to not carry him to a good match because there wasn't anything particularly wrong with Johnson in, in this match, but clearly Helmsley was the better worker. And being this slightly smaller guy was able to kind of uh, show Johnson's dominance. I would say in terms of just the, the what was shown in the match and um, the booking of it, that was probably the best match of the night. It made the most sense. It showed Ahmed Johnson in the strongest possible light. And I'm sure won Helmsley a few brownie points with those guys backstage after what had happened at Madison Square Garden when Nash and Scott Hall left. The two tag matches were pretty inconsequential, to be honest. Obviously, the first one with Sonny was horrible. Um, the body donors looked pretty good for what they were doing, um, and I kind of wish I'd have been able to see more of them. Um sort of back in the day really um it might be i suppose an idea potentially from my point of view to go back to this sort of time and and sort of chart their sort of title run and defenses and and chasing of the belt um if you guys are particularly knowledgeable on that please let me know whether you think that's worth my time or not because they look pretty good in this match um it's just a shame that the whole thing was centered around sunny because she really really annoys me Likewise, the six-man tag was just uh, an advert, really, for uh, International Incident. Cornette mentioned the name International Incident about five or six times on commentary in a match that probably didn't even last about five, six minutes um, and really was only there to advertise that and also give the win back to Bulldog and Vader. Yeah, it was all right, I guess. Um, yeah. And the main event, um, it kind of showed Austin in a very ruth ruthless um, manner. It showed him being predominantly on top of the match through kind of heelish tactics of targeting the knee and kind of working that knee against um, kind of the environment as well to kind of get that upper hand because he knew he couldn't solely do it by his ability. He had to use the environment as well. Um... But the ending really did kind of sour me on that match. And not only the ending, but the post-match after the ending. There were no sort of repercussions of any kind. Austin didn't try and attack Goldust. Goldust didn't use this opportunity to beat down The Undertaker in any way. He just left. Austin got a couple of licks in on Taker. Taker beat him back a bit and then Austin left. It was a really, really odd way... Maybe they should have booked Austin in a match against somebody else rather than um, against Undertaker, in which case The Undertaker could have properly won his match um, and the and Austin could have also won a match as well himself or maybe even just cut a promo about how dominant he is and how the likes of Shawn Michaels and Ahmed Johnson should now be sort of quaking in their boots because he's... Won the King of the Rings so and now he's after some gold. I don't know, that may have been better. Putting them in the ring together just seemed odd because they both needed the win and obviously both couldn't get it. But there we go. So yes, they were my thoughts overall on the Raw after the King of the Ring 96. If you have fond memories of that time, um, that pay-per-view specifically, or just that era of WWE history... Please uh, shout me out in the comments below, um, start up a bit of a chat. The next Raw After will be focusing in on the Raw After WWF Invasion. Yes, it's July, it's the month of Invasion. 
I very much remember that pay-per-view and enjoying it at the time, but not being overly familiar with the kind of the nitty-gritty, if you like. I knew about the big overarching storyline, but because I wasn't watching Raw week to week, I was kind of just picking up bits here and there. So I want to kind of get into the nitty-gritty of what happened on the Raw after. Obviously, we all remember the Raw before Invasion, where the old Stone Cold came back. But what happened after he turned and joined the Alliance? We will find out next month on the Raw after. But until then, I've been that British guy, and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.